Hi ladies, welcome to the Women's Wisdom Village. This is a weekly or nearly weekly gathering I host here on Zoom where we explore and discuss how myth, story, and archetypes can help us get a big picture view of what's going on in our lives and in the world. If you're watching this particular video, this is a re-recording of the original Women's Wisdom Village evening on June 14th, 2020. We had some technical problems with the camera, so I promised the ladies I would re-record it so they could watch it again. Um, at any rate, this is where we are, looking at a mythic view. So a mythic view of the world can help us see where we've come from, where we are, and where we might go. It can help us see the historical arc of human troubles, pain, and ultimately transformation. Myth shines a light on the common denominators of the human condition. It can show us the light at the end of the tunnel and the positive possibilities of change. Understanding these human stories as descriptions of human experience can help us from falling too far down the rabbit hole of depression or anxiety and despair by reminding us that we're not the only ones who've lived through difficult times. And myth shows us that even goddesses suffer. I'm Dr. Andrea Modisette Slominski. That is a mouthful, so call me Andrea or Dr. A. And I'm very grateful that you've decided to share a uh, part of your evening or day with me for this mini workshop, Tales of Power and Prophecy. We're going to explore what ancient myths, fairy tales, and folk tales can reveal about what happens to a culture when it ignores the intuition, prophecies, and power of its women. Of course, I guess we all have a good guess of what the results of that are. So this is the plan. I'm going to break up the content I want to share with you into three sections, myth, fairy tale, and folktale. And we're going to touch a little bit on each. So let's ease into all of this talking about intuition for a minute. We've all heard of women's intuition, right? If you're here in the Women's Wisdom Village, I bet you know your intuition pretty well. <laughs> Am I right? I know when my intuition rises up, it's almost always correct to some degree, and if I ignore it, it always comes back around to bite me in the butt. Intuition is knowing something before you realize it, or having that deep feeling about a person, place, or situation. The dictionary defines intuition as the power or ability of gaining direct knowledge or understanding without evident rational thought and inference or the experience of immediate apprehension of cognition, quick and ready insight. I'm sure all of us at one time or another have had a moment where we thought, ah, I should have listened to my inner voice about that situation. I should have listened to my intuition. Well, intuition comes from that deep place within us that remembers our experiences of life and applies that knowledge to our current situations. So let's imagine that our intuition rises up to encourage a choice or a decision or the opposite, to warn you about a situation. The facts of the moment and your reality support your intuitive feeling. If you speak it aloud, are you prophesying about your future? If your intuition rises up about something in our culture and you speak it aloud, proclaiming an impending problem or a breakthrough, are you prophesying about our possible cultural future? Where does intuition arise from? Well, Carl Jung would say it arises from the self with a capital S. The self is the central construct of our whole being in archetypal psychology. It's the fundamental framework of who we are. It's the place that's our deep center, encompassing the connections of our conscious and unconscious mind to the physical world of experience and to the collective unconscious. The self is the center of the psyche, the Greek word for soul, mind, spirit, one's life, or even the animating principle of life. Our psyches are connected to myths, stories, and symbols, and archetypes as expressions of understanding what it means to be human. Through them, we make sense of the world in which we live. Myth, story, archetype, and personal narrative are all terms that relate back to each of our personal journeys. A mythic view of life, again, helps us to see a big picture perspective, 
regarding where we are in our life story and what's happening at any moment, not only in our personal lives, but what's happening in our culture and in the world. Your personal myth or journey is how you understand yourself, your culture and the world and your place in it. To me, the most powerful part of a personal myth is how it frames our view of the cosmos and all life in it. It defines a framework for all relationship. Myths are the stories of humanity throughout time, revealing inner truths of our shared experience. They offer perspective on how women have dealt with challenge and adversity since the early beginnings of culture. All of this is important to know because myths are stories about the experiences of being human. They're stories of victory and defeat, great suffering and enormous joy that show us we are not alone. We are not the first to suffer. We are not the first to experience the challenges of, whoops, sorry about that, of living as teenagers. Let me just readjust this. Lovers, mothers, partners, empty nesters, midlifers, and aging wise women. The goddesses lived our stories, and we live the goddesses' stories. The stories of their trials and tribulations encompass the range of experiences of being a woman. We are not the first women to be dismissed, usurped, degraded, misused, gaslighted, and disregarded. Nor are we the first to be adored, worshipped, pursued, honored, loved, and respected. Now, there are many written records about life in ancient Greece. Some of them come to us from history, some from literature, but... We know that the Temple of Apollo at Delphi was among the most important centers of religious and cultural activity. It was the seat of the Oracle of Delphi. Yet, if we look even further back into earlier Greek legends, we find a different story. This earlier legend said that the creation of the founding of the temple was done by the goddess Gaia. Gaia in the Greek mythology is the first goddess of creation. She is the primordial earth goddess, the primordial mother of the cosmos and earth and all matter. Now, having founded the earth, Gaia settled at the center of what would have been the Greek world. And from the mud left over after creation, she gave birth to a huge python that guarded her temple. The temple was situated at what was believed by the Greeks to be the center of the earth. And it housed the oracular stone or the omphalos. This sacred stone was considered to be the navel of the world and was also believed to be the first dry land that emerged after the great flood of creation. Now, the temple was originally named Pytho, not Delphi. And in later legends and myths, Apollo slew the python and claimed Pytho as his own, changing the name to Delphi. Now, there are a few different myths about how and why this happened, in a fit of remorse from killing Python, Apollo went to Crete to absolve himself of his transgression. And after purifying himself from his deed, he had to beg the god Pan for the gift of prophecy, which he evidently must have destroyed in the temple when he killed Python. And of course, since there still is prophecy and oracles that come from the temple of Apollo in classical Greece, we had to have some part of the story that restored that after Gaia was basically ousted from the temple. Now, I don't have time to cover all of the myths regarding Apollo's engagement with Python and his taking over of the temple in Delphi, but coming forward in time to classical Greece, Delphi is the center of the oracle in Apollo's temple. The oracle was always a woman. The oracle would enter an altered state of consciousness wherein she would communicate with the god Apollo and men who came to the temple to ask a question of the oracle Apollo would answer their questions, and the Pythia, or the oracle, would relay the messages to the questioner. The oracle was given the ceremonial name Pythia after the great python. At times in history, there were two or three women who acted as oracles or who served as oracles in the temple. And the Pythia's declarations and messages determined many things, when Greece would go to war, when farmers would plant, and everything in between. Many important decisions were made on the oracle's declarations. Now, she would sit on a stool placed over a crack 
in the temple floor from which intoxicating vapors would emerge and float up and engulf her, allowing her to expand her mind and see the past and the future and commune with the god Apollo. From the 7th century BC to the 4th century CE, she was the most powerful woman in the classical Greek world. The more than 500 oracular statements from the Oracle of Delphi that have survived from various sources predicted winning battle strategies, advised successful political strategies, foretold the end of monarchies, proclaimed the wisdom of Socrates, the death of Lysander, the conquests of Alexander the Great, the death of Nero, and many, many more. In 392 AD, the Christian emperor Theodosius closed the temple. The last message that was given was, all is ended. In five years, the emperor was dead. And in 15 years, Rome fell. Now, from the beginning, the oracle was tied to the primordial feminine, to Gaia, the mother of all. The Pythia used her trance-induced intuition, imagination, and mystical access to some kind of direct universal knowledge to guide individuals and nations for centuries. The original mother goddess, through the consciousness of women, Greece was advised from 1400 BCE, if we validate early legends, to 392 AD. It was the rise of Christianity in the Roman world and the masculinization of the divine that began the dissolution of the sacred sites and temples that were dedicated to the gods and goddess of Greece and the pagan world. Is it possible that the hallucinogenic, mystical, altered mind state that the oracles experienced tapped into that deep place in the collective psyche where time doesn't exist and all things are simultaneously? Well, recently, physicists like Dr. Christine Miller, she's the joint director for the Center of Time at the University of Sydney. How, how cool of a place is that to work? The Center for Time. At, at any rate, she and other physicists have proposed a new four-dimensional model of the universe and of time space called the block theory where the past, present, and future exist simultaneously. Now, I'm not a physicist, and I can't explain this theory to you. You can look it up. But it does make me wonder if intuition, synchronicity, psychic abilities, and prophetic visions might not come from the intersection of the deepest layers of ourself and the collective unconscious, where everything that happened or is happening or will happen remains always as potential in the images that our psyches claim in the dream state, through our imagination, creativity, or altered states of consciousness. Now, looking at another myth from, uh, from Greece, Cassandra is another prophetess and seer of the future, whose story comes to us from the Greek myth of Troy. She was the most beautiful daughter of the last king of Troy, Priam. And the myths surrounding her are numerous. One is that she was a virgin priestess of Apollo, and he was so entranced with her beauty that he fell in love with her, and he offered her the gift of prophecy if she would have sex with him. Well, she accepted, and she said yes, and she accepted the gift of prophecy and then later changed her mind, and she didn't want to have sex with him. So he cursed her then never to be believed. Another myth is that she and her brother from childhood were studying and practicing to be priest and priestess of Apollo at the Temple of Apollo, and that as children they were given the gift of prophecy while sleeping in the temple. And snakes actually slithered up to them while they slept and licked their ears, allowing them to hear the signs and the portents of the future. Now here again we have the symbol of the snake in Gaia's temple, connected with the gifts of prophecy. A third myth is that Cassandra broke no promise, that her powers were given to her freely by Apollo as a gift, hoping to entice her to love him because he gave her this wonderful gift. And when that failed to entice her to love him and she did not fall in love with him, then Apollo cursed her to be disbelieved. In the myth, Cassandra tried to warn Troy of so many things, but because of the curse of Apollo, no one believed her. She predicted the abduction of Helen, 
the return of Helen with Paris to Troy, and saw that it would start the war that would destroy Troy. She warned the Trojans not to accept the Trojan horse. She even tried to attack it with an axe herself. And she's credited with the, the um, phrase that we use sometimes, uh, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. During the sacking of Troy, she hid in the temple of Athena, claiming sanctuary. While it did no good, she was raped by Ajax at the foot of Athena's statue, and then given away as the spoils of war to Agamemnon. Even after all she endured at the hands of the gods and men, she warned Agamemnon of his own murder and her murder, which was going to happen by the hand of Agamemnon's ex-wife and her lover. Cassandra would not lie down and give herself as chattel in a transaction. I have to wonder, as a devoted priestess of Apollo, wasn't she deserving of those gifts on her merits of sacred service? Or if it was a gift of childhood, when does a woman get to have sovereignty over her body without being punished? So what is Apollo's curse and what does it have to do with us? Well, thinking about current events, how many women telling the truth to power have men in our male-dominated patriarchal culture and capitalistic industries worked to discredit? How many women have powerful men labeled as mentally unfit, liars, deviants, and sluts for not going along with the status quo? How many women have tried to speak truth to power about rape, abuse, and misogyny to be silenced or not believed? And what of the women who launched hashtag me too and hashtag times up? What of all the women who added their testimony, putting their stories of humiliation, abuse, and rape at the hands of the conquering heroes of our time into the temple of public commerce to be battered and abused again? Yet the truth comes out. Troy burns and men fall from grace. It also makes me think of Greta Thunberg. If we look at her work through the lens of myth, she is serving Gaia. She's like a young priestess honoring and trying to protect the earth in the way that she knows how, while warning us at the same time about what is to come if we don't take action. Does this make her a prophetess? How many have tried to discredit her and her movement from all around the world? Are all these women Cassandra? To know something deep in your being with your intuition and experience, with facts and the truth, and then to speak it, and then be silenced, discredited, reviled, called crazy, humiliated, gaslighted, or violated, is to be Cassandra. True to herself and her gifts until death, Cassandra also suffered. Now I want to shift to the world of fairy tales. One of my favorites for its power and its message of awakening for women is Bluebeard. Do you all know the tale? Well, let's brief, briefly review. Bluebird, Bluebird, I keep saying that, Bluebeard was a rich man with a fine estate, but was very unattractive, and he had an ugly blue beard. He wanted to marry, so he hosted a week-long party for a local family to entertain and woo their daughters. He really didn't care which one the, mo the mother offered him to marry. The older daughters didn't like him, but the younger was impressed with his wealth and, and the parties and thought, well, maybe he isn't that bad looking. He'd been married many times before, and no one knew what had happened to his former wives. So the younger daughter married him, and she moved into the castle. And a month later, Bluebeard had to leave on business for six weeks. He told her she could do whatever she wanted. She could have her family, her friends come and stay, throw parties, banquets, spend money, whatever she wanted to do. He gave her his key ring with all the keys to all the storehouses and treasure rooms. And he told her, you may go into any room you want. But then, showing her the smallest key on the keychain, he told her, whatever you do, do not open the door that fits this key. She promised she wouldn't, and he left. Well, weeks later and many parties, the bride and her sisters were going through the castle and all the doors. There was treasure and all kinds of good things behind the doors. At last, she came to the final door that fits the key and, unable to stop her curiosity, despite Bluebeard's warning, opens the door to find the former wives murdered 
blood and bones and body parts everywhere, a horrible, grisly scene. Frightened, she drops the little key on the floor, picks it up, and quickly locks the door. But there's a blood stain on the key that won't go away, and it keeps weeping blood. No matter what she does, no matter how she cleans it, no matter what spells or herbs she uses on it, the little key keeps weeping blood. Well, Bluebird Beard returns and notices the little key is missing and knows that his wife has seen and been in the room. And he declares he will murder her too. It has come her time to die. Well, she throws herself at his feet, begging for mercy. And she begs him for a moment to say her prayers before she dies. And he acquiesces and gives her 15 minutes to prepare to die. In this time, her brothers who were coming to visit arrive just in the nick of time and kill Bluebeard just before he slits her throat. And she inherits all the wealth and lives happily ever after. Fairy tales, because they deal with characters that are broad types, such as princesses, princes, the old woman, the young girl, the witch, the good mother, the evil stepmother, the wise old man, and so forth. All of these characters present as types, always with the same attributes, and have very few distinguishing individual traits, like an ordinary character would. They represent archetypes, images of human experience. We understand them through their image as aspects of our deeper selves. We all have some of these fairy tale characters within us. We are all the princess, the witch, the good mother, the bad mother, the sister, and so forth. They tell the story of how we learn to reconcile aspects of our personal power and agency through the process of awakening and growing into a new level of self-understanding and life. Each of us has what is called our shadow side. It's the parts of ourselves that we don't like, that we want to ignore, deny, or repress. It can be the self-negating energies that keep us from becoming all that we are meant to be. Bluebeard represents or is an image of the shadow that lives in all of us, that wants to lead us down the path of self-destruction, a dark energy that's stalking our inner self, that is attempting to keep us trapped within the confines of numbed acceptance or of limitation, and that threatens our lives to keep us from opening the door to empowered self-discovery. The pull to despair, darkness, and self-destruction is balanced by our intuition our insight, our endurance, our creativity, and our potential in our engagement in relationship. By opening the last door with the smallest key, we gain the biggest insight. We choose to see. We tear off the band-aid of the illusion. We no longer deny our own inner instinct of the curiosity to know and learn and grow into our most actualized selves. But to do this, we must come face to face with the darkness and destruction within our shadow. Not to succumb to it, but to acknowledge it. It's by our own strategies that we control our inner Bluebeard, who is the eternal outcast, destroying all he comes in contact with. Our strategies, like the bride's, can control him long enough so that in the pause, we can marshal our inner helpers. The bride calls out to her sisters to ask if her brothers are coming. These sisters are the awakened feminine parts of her psyche. The warnings from her intuition. They see the danger that the bride ignored from the start. They help to hold space for the arrival of the brothers, who represent an archetype of the loving, balanced, non-devouring masculine energies within the psyches of both men and women. They are the energies of taking effective action. Now, let's make a swerve and a plot twist and look at two folktales. Falsehood and Truth and the Withered Tree. Folktales often are seeking truth, and these truths can be seen in the conflicts and the demand for social justice in their narratives. They show us a stark contrast between the way we live and the way people lived in the past. These tales set up a comparison, testing our principles of truth and humanity, asking us if we measure up to the convictions of truth from a different time. They prompt us to ask what is righteous, what is true? 
And if we find truth, then we must serve truth by being just. These two tales are very short, and I'm going to read them to you. Falsehood and Truth was written in 1884 by Edouard Laboulet. So let me get the book, and I'm going to read it to you directly from the book. Okay, Falsehood and Truth. In olden times, falsehood and truth resolved to live together like a pair of friends. Truth was a good person, simple, timid, and confident. Falsehood was a smooth talker, elegant and daring. One commanded and the other always obeyed. Everything went well in such a friendly partnership. One day, falsehood suggested to Truth that she would do well to plant a tree that would provide them with blossoms and flowers in the spring, shade in the summer, and fruit in the autumn. Truth was pleased with the plan and the tree was planted right away. As soon as it began to grow, falsehood said to Truth, Sister, let us each choose a part of the tree. A community that is too close together breeds strife. Good accounts make for good friends. For example, there are the roots of the tree. They support and nourish it. They are sheltered from the wind and weather. Why don't you take them? To oblige you, I will content myself for my part with the branches that grow in the open air at the mercy of birds, beasts, and men, wind, heat, and frost. There's nothing that we would not do for those we love. Confused by such generosity, Truth thanked her comrade and burrowed underground to the great joy of falsehood. Who found himself alone among the people and was able to reign at his ease. The tree grew fast and its large branches spread shade and coolness far and wide, and it soon produced blossoms more radiant than the rose. Men and women came from everywhere to admire the marvel. Perched upon the topmost branch, falsehood called to them and soon charmed them with his sweet words. He taught them that society is nothing but falsehood, and that men should be ready to tear each other to pieces if they spoke the truth. There are three ways to succeed here below, he added, by simple falsehood, as when the slave says to the Lord, I respect and love you. By double falsehood, as when he exclaims, May lightning strike me if I am not your most faithful servant and by triple falsehood, as when he repeats, my wealth, my arm, and all my life belong to my Lord, and then he deserts his master at the moment of danger. The sly falsehood gave these lessons in a cheerful manner and supported them with such appropriate examples that everyone who heard them was thrilled by his words. They pointed to those who did not applaud and even began to suspect each other. For a hundred miles around, nobody talked about anything except falsehood and his wisdom. Some thought he should be king. As to good truth, who lay crouching in her den, no one gave her a thought. She might just as well have been dead and forgotten. Abandoned as she was by everyone, forced to live on whatever she could find beneath the ground, while falsehood was enthroned among green pastures and flowers. One day the poor mole gnawed the bitter roots of the tree that truth had planted, and it gnawed them so deep that another day, when falsehood more eloquent than usual, was addressing a large crowd of people, the wind rose slightly and suddenly blew the tree down, which no longer had any roots to support it. As branches fell, they crushed all who were beneath them. Falsehood escaped with an injured eye and a broken leg, which left him lame and squinting. Nevertheless, he managed to pull himself out of trouble once again. Now truth was suddenly restored to light and rose from the ground with disheveled hair and a stern countenance and began to harshly rebuke the people around her for their weakness and credulity. No sooner did falsehood hear her voice than he cried, Look, there is the instigator of all our ills, the one who has nearly destroyed her. Death to her, death to her. As soon as the people heard this, they armed themselves with sticks and stones and pursued the unfortunate woman. Once they caught her, they pushed her again into the hole, more dead than alive. After doing this, they quickly sealed it with a large stone, so that truth might never more rise from her tomb. However, she still had a few friends, for during the night, an unknown hand carved the following epitaph upon the stone. Here lies truth, killed by the cruel world, not by illness, and now nothing can reign but falsehood and dishonesty. It is falsehood's smallest fault not to suffer contradiction. So under his sway, the people searched for Truth's friend, and as soon as he was found, he was hanged. It is only the dead who don't complain. 
To be more certain of his victory, Falsehood built himself a palace over Truth's tomb, but it is said that sometimes she turns in her grave. When this happens, the palace crumbles like a house of cards and buries all the inhabitants, both innocent and guilty, beneath its ruins. But the people have other things to do than mourn their dead. They continue to fulfill their inheritance. Those eternal dupes rebuild the palace each time more beautiful than the old ones, and falsehood, lame and squinting, continues to reign there to this very day. In this tale, truth is feminine. She's forced underground, abandoned, lied about, abused, and sealed into a tomb, all while falsehood leads the people astray. They are deceived by the appearances of daily life, the disappearance of truth. If we cannot look past the spectacle of daily life perpetrated by falsehood and the systems he has created, we will never be able to think for ourselves find truth, or serve justice. Labelle warns us that the masses will continue to follow falsehood and his lies blindly, yet truth is not dead. She is merely entombed, waiting to be released. It's almost shocking to me to consider how little has changed since 1884 and how aptly this tale describes our current situation. The Withered Tree is the next folk, folk tale I'm going to share with you. It's very short. And this tale is in Women Who Run With the Wolves by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And I'm going to read this brief tale to you too. First I have to find it. Here we are. Okay. The Withered Tree. You can tell I like this book. <laughs> There was a soul whose very bad temper had cost him more wasted time and loss of good friends than any other element in his life. He approached an old wise man in rags and asked, How can I ever bring this demon of rage under control? The old man instructed the younger man to post himself at a parched oasis far off in the desert and to sit there among the withered trees and to draw up the brackish water for any traveler who might venture there. And the man, trying to overcome his rage, rode out to the desert to the place of the withered trees. For months, garbed in rose and burnous against the flying sand, he drew sour water and gave it to all who approached. Years passed, and he suffered no more fits of temper. One day, a dark rider came to the dead oasis and gave a haughty glance down at the man who offered him water from a bowl. The rider scoffed at the clouded water, refused it, and began to ride on. The man offering the water was immediately enraged, so much so he was blinded by it, and seizing the rider down from his camel, killed him on the spot. Oh, la! He was immediately aggrieved that he had been consumed by such rage. And look what it had come to. Suddenly, up rode another rider at great speed. The rider looked down upon the visage of the dead man and exclaimed, Thank Allah you have killed the man who was on his way to murder the king. And at that moment, the cloudy water of the oasis turned clear and sweet, and the withered trees of the oasis, bluish green, and burst into joyous bloom. Though this tale is about a man, we'll look at it symbolically. It's a tale about learning when to release anger, not releasing it randomly, but at the right time. The man in the story is referred to as Soul. Soul went to the well at the oasis far from others on the advice of the wise old man. Soul would go somewhere where he would waste no more time and lose no more friends because of his anger. He would learn to repress and control his anger through service. Years passed and there was no interaction that would tempt his anger. No interactions that would test his resolve to change or increase his self-understanding, just the numbing sameness of the days. Because he is never triggered to be angry, he is satisfied with his progress and place. However, in the end, when he releases his anger and kills the traveler, he first feels that he has failed, his old anger is back, uncontrolled, and look what he has done, only to find out from the next traveler 
that sometimes anger is justified and needs to be expressed. Repressing our anger by withdrawing it into ourselves and denying that we are angry or glossing over the injustices that we suffer doesn't empower us to learn to harness the power of our anger for positive change. That anger, when applied and expressed appropriately, can be the spark to healing and right action. So let's recap what we started with tonight, talking about intuition as a capability that we all have to intuit our own future, myth and women's prophecy, where I shared that the establishment of the temple and prophecy by Gaia, protected by the python, which is the great snake symbol of the regeneration of life, and also the Eurobarus and eternity. Then Apollo takes over the temple, the Pythia, the women advising and directing nations, until the shuttering of the temple and the end of pagan worship. Cassandra next, the gifted prophetess cursed for her desire for bodily sovereignty, ignored, raped, abused, and murdered. Women's intuition is a powerful force that we can tap into and use to our advantage. Cultures who ignore and denigrate the divinity and wisdom of the feminine are blinding themselves to the power of prophecy. Fairy tales? Bluebeard and the power of the shadow and its destructive impulses that keep women from using the key and opening the door to deeper self-knowledge and growth. If we don't acknowledge our inner Bluebeard, we will not reach our potential. And folk tales, reminding us to look past the charade and the empty facade of public pageant, asking us to look for truth beneath it all, because truth will always lead to the pursuit of justice. Truth must be liberated and falsehood revealed in order to pursue true justice. And finally, that there's a time and a place to understand and use our anger in a powerful and mindful way. If we suppress our anger and rage and don't learn to use and express it, we will live in the desert of isolation and lose a valuable source of personal power for action and healing. Now, if you're watching this recording of the mini workshop lecture, then unfortunately you missed the lively discussion of the live Zoom chat. But here are a few of the topics that came up. We talked about what's happening now in our nation. Who are our prophetesses, if we have any? There are so many other women that we could consider. We talked about Hillary for her warnings about Trump, love her or hate her. Much of what she said in the debates has turned out to be true. Are Marie Yovanovitch, Fiona Hill, Sally Yates, prophetesses? Prophetesses? They all told us about the burial of truth in the tomb. Uh, Rachel Maddow came up, loved by some, hated by others. She proclaims the numbers of the pandemic nightly, despite false narratives. Greta Thunberg, yes, definitely. Taranya Burke, who began hashtag me too, is a prophetess. So are the 300 women who founded Time's Up. Women from these movements were treated like Cassandra, yet they prevail. Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Colors, the founders of Black Lives Matter, are prophetesses too. Focusing attention on racial injustice in American life, they call us to use the small key and open the door to individual and institutional racism in our nation and to face the truth so that we can grow and heal together. All of these women proclaim truth. After the murder of George Floyd and so many other black Americans at the hands of the police, it seems like the nation is finally listening. And after three weeks of worldwide protests, the time is now for our mindful, focused anger to promote the search for truth and the need for justice. Women's prophetic leadership has come full circle at a time when social, economic, health, and environmental disasters threaten life as we know it here on Earth. By 2030, the UN deadline for meaningful climate action, there will be over 87 million U.S. women over 45. We are the 87 million, and together we can change the world. It starts in our hearts and minds, moves into our own backyards, our communities, states, and the nation. This is Dr. A saying thanks for joining and listening to the re-recording of the June 14th event. If you'd like to join us in the Women's Wisdom Village, you can go to my website at www 
Dr. Dot, Dr. Andrea Slominski.com and go to the events tab and see when the next event's coming up. They are no cost support group meetings for women in this challenging time of life during all of these incredible COVID-19 and social uprisings and the hopeful coming of major change to our culture. Until next time, this is Dr. A saying, have a soulful, soulful week.